the Gospel of John, chapter 3, reading from the New King James Translation. Last time we began chapter 3 as Nicodemus came seeking Jesus and really learned about, a lot about himself and the belief and trust in the work of the Spirit of God. He had just asked, as we finished up, he had just asked, how can these things be in response to Jesus' explanation of being born again or born from above? And it's interesting to note that we don't hear anything else from Nicodemus in this conversation. And we do see him later on in the gospel um, and, and, and practicing his faith, actually. But in this conversation, that's it. And his last thing, how can these things be? And he got a great explanation. We'll continue that this week. We finish with verse 12. And as Jesus began answering, so I'll start in verse 12 to pick up the context. And we'll read through verse 21 for our text today. Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 12. If I have told you, this is Jesus speaking, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as, G as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I think I'll save the rest of the text for a bit later. But we see here that Jesus has been telling Nicodemus about the things happening in his life here on earth and how that relates to his spiritual condition. And uh, then he begins to, wants to tell him more about heavenly things. And, you know, there, there can be a roadblock in our lives to, to learning what Jesus has for us about eternal things, about spiritual things, if we don't believe him about earthly things. So our first life lesson is pretty much the same as the last one last time. Trust what Jesus tells you about life here on earth. And you can trust what Jesus tells you about eternity in heaven. Trust what Jesus tells you about life here on earth. And you can trust what Jesus tells you about eternity and heaven. Now Jesus continues with his teaching in verse 13, saying, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now... My knee-jerk reaction is, well, how about Enoch? I mean, he said no one's ascended to heaven. How about Enoch? By, Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then I thought, well, how about Elijah? You know, and 2 Kings 2.11 tells us, then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now in the case of Enoch, we're not told specifically that God took him to heaven, but I'm pretty sure God didn't just, you know, pick him up, drop him off somewhere on the planet, maybe on a deserted island or drop him in a volcano or something. The scripture doesn't tell us, but it does say he did not see death. So he probably, you know, he wasn't here on the earth, okay, because he would have died. But with Elijah, it does specifically say he went up by a whirlwind, not a chariot of fire. A chariot of fire went by, caused a whirlwind. That took Elijah into heaven. Now, you might think, oh, well, this guy's supposed to be teaching the Bible and believing Jesus, but he's saying that Jesus wasn't right here. Well, no, I'm not doubting what Jesus said, but I do want to do my due diligence, so to speak, in this verse, because... When it seems that something you're reading is not 100% correct, then either, I mean, in anywhere in life, either that person is not telling the truth properly or the way you're hearing it is not the way it's meant to be taken. So as you're learning to trust Jesus, as Nicodemus was here, it's important so you don't let an uneasiness uh, linger in your heart and, and build in your life, and especially when it's something coming from our Savior. So our life lesson here is, when in doubt, check it out. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. When in doubt, check it out. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. In other words, dig deeper. Find out what the meaning is and don't allow doubts to undermine your faith. And most of the time, you'll find the answers. And to be honest, sometimes you may not get a clear explanation uh, an understanding, and you just pretty much have to put that totally in God's hand and trust him to provide that answer later on. Mm -hmm. And it's just beautiful the way he does that. And sometimes it's years, and then all of a sudden the light bulbs come on right when you need them, and right when it makes a difference in your life. So 
The good news is with today's passage, checking it out, either way, it does check out. Okay, first, uh, I reviewed every scripture that talks about ascending in the Bible. It was referencing, uh, it was referencing something going up under its own power. Okay, it could be a person or an angel or smoke, you know, like incense burning. Of course, smoke rises because it's warmer, it rises up. It was ascending, um, and it's essentially rising under its own power. But the reference to angels doesn't tell a lot about it. It just simply, simply says things like they were ascending and descending from heaven. And we don't know what kind of power they have or how that works. Don't understand that. Um, don't need to understand that at this point in time. Uh, but it wasn't a whirlwind and it wasn't God grabbing them and pulling them off the planet, kind of like what happened to Enoch. So we, we know they have some sort of system we don't know about. But in people, all the references to other people were that they were climbing, they were going up a hill or going upstairs or coming up out of a hole. Uh, so in the first regard, neither Enoch nor Elijah ascended under their own power into heaven. It was God that was taking them away. So they did not ascend. Now, the second meaning here is, can also be, be interpreted by the context. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus of heavenly things and is about to give some prophecies that would affect every person on the planet. Jesus is talking about eternal life, the life that God originally intended for each one of us humans, for the whole human race. But since all of creation was on earth was cursed by man's disobedience, that eternal life only exists in heavenly places now. Now, there have been prophets in the past that brought messages from heaven, but how did they get these prophecies? They were given to them by God. The prophets were not speaking from firsthand experience. Even Enoch and Elijah, if you dig into it, they went up into heaven without seeing death first. They were also prophets. They made prophecies. God gave them the words of prophecies that they made, and they were prophesied before they were taken up into heaven. They didn't come down afterwards and make these prophecies of eyewitness things they had seen. Uh, so again, Jesus' words ring true that you know the only one that's a, you know that's ascended and come back down and kept telling you those words is the Son of Man. So we have another little thing. I'm, again, I, I got this weird thing going in my brain. I got I got to make sure everything, all, all the bases are covered. So Jesus ascended to heaven, but when? You know, the first thing I thought of is happened immediately after the resurrection. John 20, 17 tells us that after Mary recognized him in the garden, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. But didn't Jesus just say in verse 13, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven before the resurrection, obviously, before he had gone through the crucifixion. And so it had the, the ascension he's talking about and the coming down had to take place before his conversation with Nicodemus. So we know from the scripture study that the very beginning of our studies here in John that Jesus himself is creator God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, Jesus, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. I went into a lot of details in our last, our previous teaching, but we see Jesus was definitely here in the beginning and naturally would have had to ascend back and forth to the heavens in this process of creation. In addition, the Bible does say, just to, to give you a little more strength than that, <laughs> uh, the Bible says, says the Lord God, which is Yahweh, what we transliterate as Yahweh Elohim, uh, which is, uh, we talked about that back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, we discussed that Elohim was a plural word for one God. And we didn't really, it really wasn't revealed strongly to people until the New Testament revealed uh, Elohim, multiple gods in one God, so to speak. That's not a totally theologically accurate statement, but uh, it revealed it as Father God, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was there during that creation, went back and forth between heaven and the Garden of Eden. Uh, also, many believe that in the Holy Scriptures and the Hebrew Scriptures, when there's a reference to an angelic messenger, specifically as the angel of the Lord, that it's a theophany. And that means it's actually Jesus himself appearing in an angelic body to personally bring messages to men. So our life lesson here is that God came to earth many times personally to give us his messages. 
Today, he gives you his messages as you read the Bible. God came to earth many times to personally give us his messages. Today, he gives you his messages as you read the Bible. I think that is so cool because, you know, someone says, oh, I'll say God when he comes and, show, you know, and shows himself to me. Well, how many times do you want to see it? <laughs> you know, how many times? It's, we have records of it over and over. We see him many, many times that Jesus uh, came and ascended and returned to heaven. And it's important because it sets up the fact that Jesus, again, is an eyewitness to heavenly things. And his prophecies, um, when he prophecies that something will happen or that something is like this in heaven, he doesn't need to preface it saying, thus saith the Lord, like we read in the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures. He doesn't have to say, God gave me a vision and this is what he said. Jesus doesn't have to do that. No, his words are directly from God in heaven to us. And there's no doubt, no question, it's settled truth when he says it. Here, um, in this verse, this next verse, or very early in his ministry, before many of the disciples had even caught on to what he's doing, we, we read verse 14, and he predicts this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, of course, here he was speaking of the crucifixion. He'd already talked about his death uh, prior to this time, which is really interesting for someone that's just starting out in ministry. But the disciples didn't understand until, until later. Now, I'd love to get into a, a Bible study on all aspects of this verse. Um, I, I started to dig in. It's like, this is going to be like six weeks long. <laughs> it would be a, you can get a couple hours, but do write down Numbers chapter 21. I encourage you to study out this passage in Numbers 21. For time's sake, I'm going to do a flyover. Um, and what happened is... Uh, that we see that God, through Moses' leadership, had just given the Israelites the victory over their enemies. But as they traveled in the wilderness, what happens? It happens a lot of times to us as we have a victory in the Lord, we see something great happen, we get discouraged. The Israelites got discouraged right after this victory, and instead of praising God and looking to Moses to lead them, they started grumbling and complaining against God. Not recommended, okay? Uh, they were soon hit with the plague of poisonous stakes, and many people died in that process. At that point, they finally repented and begged Moses to pray for God's help. Now, I'm not saying anything about COVID at this point in time. <laughs> but in Numbers 21.8, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, after, after the people begged Moses to ask God to take this away, the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Now, he didn't, say, he didn't take away the snakes, did he? He said, if you get bit, look on this serpent. It's lifted up. Now, again, Jesus is making a connection to the Hebrew scriptures that people are familiar with, using an earthly illustration to tie divine concepts together for them. Now, make no mistake about it, this was just not a convenient comparison. It's like, huh, I wonder, I wonder what's like me being crucified. Could it be a, a snake being lifted up in the wilderness? No, no. God had planned this connection long before this happened, this incident happened in the wilderness. And why did he plan that? He planned it so that the people could see his marvelous works and that people could make the connection to see how salvation would go to the entire world through this. And so the next question that I had was, why is Jesus comparing himself to a snake, to a serpent? Isn't the serpent in the Garden of Eden the tool that Satan used to persuade man to turn away from God? Yes, it was. Weren't the serpents that were afflicting Israel a punishment for complaining about God and Moses instead of trusting in God and, and his leader? Well, yes, they were. But God turned that around in that once people realized their sin, repented and believed in God's power to save them, this was the plan he gave them. So instead of perishing, all they had to do was look upon what had been the symbol of their sin. The serpent lifted up and God would save them, would save their lives. We read in Genesis 50, 20, and of another incident, the conclusion, or close to the conclusion of another incident, where a lot of bad things had happened to Joseph. And then he observed, as it was all coming back together for good, he said, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Our life lesson here is that what the enemy intends for evil in our lives is the very thing God uses for good to save many people. What the enemy uses 
what the enemy intends for evil in our lives is the very thing that God uses for good to save many people. God takes these things our enemies meant to, for evil, turns them around, brings good to us. In our text, Jesus con connects the symbol of death for disobedient man, the serpent, to Jesus himself being lifted up on the cross, taking our sin upon him, taking our death, taking the punishment for these things so he can bring us life. Jesus then says in verse 15, continues with that statement about looking upon the Son of Man lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Wow. Whoever believes, we studied that out before, whoever believes, trusts in, clings to, relies upon Jesus, should not perish, not be destroyed in eternal punishment, uh, separated, totally separated from God, but have eternal life. As we'll see in chapter 10, not just life, it's a living like we do on earth here, but full, abundant, overflowing life forever. You can look to Jesus today for that life, full and abundant. And it's awesome. <laughs> it's just, it's great. We're going to cover a little more, but I, I do want to point out something else in here that uh, I just, I'm seeing these patterns and it's that there is a lot of Jewishness in the Gospel of John. Okay, and by that, by that I mean a lot of what we found in John is directly connected to the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament or first century Jewish practices uh, and the locations and the conditions that existed then. And um, much of it from John 1.19, from that verse up through John 3.15, the one we're just finishing with, a lot of that you have to really dig in to find. It's not really easily apparent to someone who's un unfamiliar with the Hebrew Scriptures. Even so, last week we saw where uh, what was strongly inferred was that salvation was not limited to the Jews. And so that was a directly connected there. But God is so incredibly awesome and merciful to us, inter to us ignorant Gentiles. Okay? I don't know if you all have Jewish or Gentile background, but, you know, I'm a Gentile. And, you know, for thousands of years it was thought they have no hope. You know, Gentiles, literally idol worshipers. They're evil. They ain't going to get saved. Once in a while, maybe would wander, one would wander in and the Jews would take them in, have mercy on them, but it wasn't, it wasn't the rule. Well, in the Gospel of John, the first 18 verses, if you read the Gospel of John, the first 18 verses grab onto you with some amazing thing to anybody of any background. It does have some, some correlations to Hebrew scriptures, but it's still something that just, it's a narrative that just grabs you. You can't help but, but be glued to it. And then we read about things that are kind of culturally and, and religiously Jewish for a while. And then we see them tied back together to make sense to non-Jewish people. In fact, right now as we're going into verse 16 and through verse 21, they're perfectly understandable to anyone of any background or faith or geographical location. So they don't have to have a, a you know, a background in Jewish history to come to Jesus. I believe if someone only finds these verses that I'm about to read, they will find enough in them to fully understand man's condemned situation, what the problem is, how to solve that problem, how to begin to live for God, and how to understand that there's only one possible way they can be saved from that condemnation. That's a lot for uh, six verses. So I'm going to read them now. Verse 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he is not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and doesn't come to that light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Wow. Death, life, eternity, all explained in six verses. There's a lot more in the Bible. Don't just stop there, but just, let's dig in what's, what's here for a few minutes. Uh, we, we find out that eternal life is offered to whom it's offered and the connection of God's love to Jesus Christ's purpose and activity here on earth. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish 
but have everlasting, everlasting life. <laughs> Ever-loving life too, okay? God's love is nothing new. It's shown hundreds of times, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus simply brings it all together. He states that God's love is for the whole world, not just one special group. He said that before in many ways, but the people just didn't get it. Okay? Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying that God is a generous God. Not only having created the heavens and, and the earth and given mankind pretty much free reign to do what he wants to with it and to enjoy it, but he also gave his own son in this situation to remedy the bad that they had done. This does encourage us. It encourages us to be generous. Appreciate your generosity, brother. You've been very generous in our, in our small group here in, uh, in bringing uh, some refreshments for us each week. Uh, but, you know, Jesus also reminds us that his only, that Jesus is his God's only begotten son. And that's not a term we commonly use today. Uh, the Greek word is monogo nies, which means one and only of its kind. It was usually used for only son or only daughter in relationship to their parents. So when used of Christ, it denotes the only begotten or only born son of God. Now we read in John 1 that we can be given power to become the children of God. And Ephesians 1 to 5 and Galatians 4 to 5 make it clear that technically we're not born physically into God's family, but we're adopted into God's family as children. However, there was only one unique son of God, and that was Jesus. Now make a mental note of this for, for future times when you talk to people of, of different system, belief systems, and it makes, it makes it impossible, basically. Any idea that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. This is an idea that was vented in the 1800s and, and it's one reason why Mormonism or Latter-day Saints, uh, even though they say they're Christians, they're classified as a cult. They can't be trusted because they deny what the Bible clearly says about who Jesus is. And you have to know who Jesus is. And we've gone through a couple of months looking at who Jesus is scripturally. And um, it also preempts any speculation from other cults. Some may say that uh, Jesus was the brother of the Archangel Michael. There's some religions that say that. Or that he was, you know, or they were both the same. That Michael was Jesus. Uh, but Jesus is the only one child physically born of God. Now the next phrase that we're looking at in, in verse 16 is whoever believes in him. Just as we saw last week with Nicodemus, a person does not need to understand everything about salvation, God's word, heaven, and the Christian life to start that everlasting life. A person doesn't need to, to go down a prescribed list of do's and don'ts to start this everlasting life. He doesn't even need to, to, to memorize or, or even have seen the 613 commandments in the Torah. Although they're great to have, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to join a church and be baptized. And this, this may surprise you, but he doesn't, I mean, he might still struggle. Can you believe that? Christians still struggle? with things in their lives. He might struggle with bad attitudes or, or habits uh, or ways that are not pleasing to the Lord when he comes to Jesus and receives that everlasting life. But Jesus says, whoever believes in him, the son of God should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus began to believe in, to trust in, rely upon and cling to Jesus and his new birth had begun. Jesus was explaining to him what had happened in his heart and life. Over time, anyone who is fully trusting and believing in Jesus will naturally allow God to cleanse the wrongs from their lives. Okay? They don't want to be practicing sinful ways that are displeasing to the Savior. Um, and, and also, things that are displeasing to God would be a roadblock from really experiencing that full and abundant life that Jesus has for a person. So they don't want to do that. They don't want to put blocks in front. They want to reinforce the life that Jesus wants to give to them. They want to practice the good things that God has for us to do. So if you see someone that they say, I've accepted Jesus, I believe in Jesus, but their life, maybe they're struggling. I mean, we do. Everybody does that from time to time. But if they're intentionally practicing and don't care about the things that are displeasing to God, I would question whether they really believe in Jesus. Okay, uh, some people have been told there's a you know magical mystical thing they do. It could be works. It could be saying a specific prayer. It could be um, joining a particular church. And then they say, okay, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to have eternal life with Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. It talks about believing, continuing. Um, 
The words make a difference, and the word for have, it's a simple word. Did anybody not know what have means? Have, in these verses, a little more than our normal have in the sense of, you know, hey, I have this piece of paper in my hand. Okay, well, that's kind of a temporary thing, and it's not a big deal. But in this phrase, the have, but have everlasting life, or have eternal life, means in the scriptures to have and to hold in the hand, in the sense of wearing, to have and hold possession of the mind, to hold fast, to keep, to involve or closely join to a person or thing. And this isn't something that happens later on after death. Okay, the life begins at birth. Our physical life begins at birth. And if you've seen a baby born, you can be absolutely assured that that baby does not have a clue about everything that's going on around him. He doesn't have an understanding about the life that he just received. Does that mean he's not alive? No, it just means he doesn't understand it all. Having and holding eternal life begins with believing in Jesus, both now in our fleshly containers, and it continues forever, long after our flesh fails us for the last, for the last time. And so our life lesson here is, Having and holding eternal life begins with believing in Jesus, both now and long after our flesh fails us. Third time it works well. Having and holding eternal life begins with believing in Jesus, both now and long after our flesh fails us. Now, to really bring together how personal this is, um, I like this. Let's put our, put our name in here. Uh, you can say this out loud after me, but use your name instead of mine. I'm going to read the same verse and put my name in, and it's not just Bob, so you know, put your name in here. For God so loved Bob that he gave his only begotten son that when Bob believes in him, Bob should not perish, but Bob will have everlasting life. And with each of you, that's you. That's awesome. That's why we call the gospel the good news. If there's good news, what's the bad news? Well, let's keep going. Um, we, we read grace and truth, grace and truth. Grace is good news. Truth sometimes is not the best news. So the next verses answer what may be the main question in unbelievers' minds today. That's why this is such a great passage to, to share with, with people that are seeking, honestly seeking the Lord. In an article written in a Christian magazine, Pastor Tim Keller said he was excited when he was approached by a very sharp New York businessman that had not been raised around church or Christians, but he had begun attending his church and, and he showed a lot of interest. But then he had a final obstacle to overcome. He told Tim, you said if we do not believe in Christ, we are lost and condemned. I'm sorry, I just can't buy that. I work with some very fine people that are Muslims and Jewish or agnostic. I can't believe they're going to hell just because they don't believe in Jesus. <coughs> In fact, I can't, recognize the, I can't reconcile the very idea of hell with a loving God, even if he is holy too. You see, so many people today reject the idea of a final judgment in hell. And unfortunately, there are many pastors that avoid this topic. But there is a balance to scriptural truth that must not be ignored in this situation. If there is no hell, then Jesus didn't have to come and die and suffer to eliminate and to take our sins upon him. If there's no hell, why do we bother telling people about Jesus? Why do we spend our resources doing that? If there's no hell, is there no justice for those that live their entire life and practice evil against others during their entire lives? In fact, the second biggest question that unbelievers have is related, and that is, why is there evil if God is good, and why does he not take it away? Well, we find the answer to both of these questions answered here immediately after Jesus presents the opportunity to receive eternal life. Remember, we keep talking about grace and truth. Jesus presented the incredible grace of God and immediately follows up with some hard truth. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So in these, these three verses, 17 to 19, we have four truths that really make a difference when you understand them. First of all, the human race 
is spoken of the world. It's a condemned race. Um, you can study it out, but the short story is God made a perfect place, created man to live forever if man chose to do so. Unfortunately, mankind chose death for his, his race. He was warned. He chose death for his race instead of continuing on the path of life. God didn't have to do anything to remedy the situation. He could have just set the whole thing on automatic, let mankind self-destruct. Okay? We're condemned race. But then we see number two. God loved mankind so much, he refused to give up hope. Although he did almost get rid of humans early on in the flood. And in fact, he did use his people multiple times, as we see again in the Hebrew scriptures, to cleanse the planet of many cultures that had gone so bad, had gone so far away, that they actually had threatened the entire population of the planet with their evil practices. So his love keeps them, kept him wanting to do something for us. We also see in number three, God is not the one condemning the world through Jesus. He's the one that's giving people the way to be saved from that condemnation. Right now, there's a virus threatened to infect and kill large numbers of our people on our planet. Let's say instead of COVID-19 being fatal to two out of every 10,000 people, as it has been so far, that it infected 100% of the population and everyone that got infected would die. That's pretty dramatic. And then before it hit me, I discovered a cure where anybody could mix together two common elements, elements that are free and currently available abundantly anywhere on the planet. Could you possibly claim that I was the one that gave everybody this virus? I don't think so. Of course not. Can you claim that I'm hateful and narrow-minded because I'm not forcing 7.8 billion people to make the, mix, make the mix and eat the cure and that I'm not out there spoon-feeding it to everybody on the planet? No kidding, that would be ludicrous. Now, what about if you say you didn't believe in me or didn't like the idea of mixing those things together and taking it and you refuse that cure? Or you say that I'm lying or that I'm the one that will cause you to die because you refuse to accept the cure? I mean, those are a lot of scenarios. Well, I guess you could say any of those things, but they wouldn't be true. You'd be wrong, literally dead wrong. The bottom line here is that sin and evil infected our entire population of our planet. God is freely giving us the cure. He is not sending people to hell. He is the one saving us from hell. And on top of that, he's giving us a wonderful eternity, far better one than one that we can even imagine, and we just have to accept his cure. So. These are things that we need to share with people, especially those that have doubts, those that, you know, that they seem like tough questions. They're, Jesus answers the questions right in the beginning of his ministry. And the other truth we find, number four here, is that when you believe in Jesus, you are not condemned. All that condemnation is gone. Romans 8 tells us in verse 1 through, through 3, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He flipped it, didn't he? <laughs> he didn't condemn mankind. He condemned the sin in the flesh. It was our downfall. Romans 8 goes on to explain even more about how that works. Again, Jot it down, got some more homework, read Romans 8 and, and see the benefits of God's rescue plan for us. It's all written out there saying, uh, you know, this plan that he has is so different from what the enemy tries to tell us about God. Um, you know, he's, he says, the enemy says, God wants you to go and suffer eternally. He wants to beat you up. He wants to, you know, beat you into submission. No, 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 not at all. He doesn't want that. Yes, the torment of eternal separation from God and all that's described in the Bible about that place is real, but God sent us the cure and God wants to cure every one of us. And he wants us to tell everyone we can reach about the cure. It would be so convenient if he had just said, here's the cure, take it, and not asked us to tell other people about it. It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? I don't know. It'd be awful hard seeing your friends dying and going to a place it's so bad, most people don't even want to talk about it. Some people don't even want to believe in it. 
but God wants us to share that with others. That's actually one of the most joyful things that you get to do in the Christian life, is that share this cure of, that gives people eternal life instead of eternal separation from God. Well, next week we'll get right into verses 20 and 21. Our time is, is going very quickly. Uh, but these verses go more into why people don't accept the light of Jesus and, uh, and how even allowing the light of Jesus to, spot, to shine on what they're doing exposes things they don't want anyone else to see. Now, just a, a little preview, that explains why for some people it's not enough to just ignore the message of Jesus. You know, somebody's like, why don't you just, if you don't believe in God, why don't you just leave it alone? No, no, it's not enough to ignore it. The message of Christ they feel they act actively have to suppress and eliminate the possibility that anyone will hear the message and their deeds will be shown. Anyway, little preview. Friends, take Jesus at his word all the time. Believe what he tells you and life can be trusted. He loves you so much. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to get to know him and believe in him. If you have any questions about your relationship with Jesus, uh, whether you're here or if you're online watching, um, or if you need anything uh, for us to pray with you about, my wife and I and, and others here would love to pray for you uh, as we conclude our fellowship here today. And uh, if you've wandered from the Lord, renew that relationship with him. And uh, if you're not sure how, how all that works, again, send a message to me and, or talk to me and we'd be glad to help you out with that. Okay? Thanks so much for being here. This time I'd like to pray a blessing over you. And it never wears out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.